So I'm continuing on with the, um, the series that we've been doing, just kind of on basic doctrines, fundamental doctrines, things that, that we need to, to keep just regularly straight in our mind and keep us focused, keep us going in the right direction and not being forgetful of all the, the foundational principles that, that we believe in this church. And um, this morning's sermon is titled, All Matters of Faith and Practice. So this is a phrase you might hear commonly, especially among a lot of Baptist churches and even other churches. And what the, the reason why I titled that is that we take the Bible, God's Word, to be the final authority. This is what all of our faith is based on. This is what our doctrines are based on. This is what everything we believe about God is based on, is found in this book. So all matters. Anything that has to do with our faith and practicing that faith, when it, you know, when it, from everything that we do in church, you know, the soul winning, the singing, the, you know, the preaching, everything is to be patterned and modeled after the instructions that we receive from this book. This is our authority. And, you know, this is something that a lot of people who don't believe in God or don't believe the Bible, we go out soul winning, you know, everyone, you know, a lot of people has their own ideas about the afterlife about God, about who God is and stuff. And then oftentimes you ask them, well, how do you know, you know, like, what makes you think you're going to heaven? What makes, you know, wh well, because I'm good. Well, why do you believe that though? Why do you believe what you believe? And for most people, it's just, well, that's just what I think. It's just something they've conjured up in their head. It's just something that makes sense to them for whatever reason, just because of their life experiences, because this is what they think to be the truth. But that's not the way that we believe. We say, this is the truth. God's word is the truth. So whatever this book says is what I'm going to believe. Amen. And that is the presupposition. And that is the foundation, literally, of our faith. This is, this is what we're basing everything on. Everything that I believe about Jesus Christ, about being saved, about heaven, about hell, is all based on this book. Amen. That's the source of the information. This is, you know, there's a lot of people can tell you about Jesus. There's a lot of people that believe in Jesus. There's a lot of people that, that, that follow a religion and they go to church regularly. I was brought up going to church regularly. But the only reason anybody knows about Jesus, you know, I mean, the people who were alive during his time, you could, you could carry down some stuff, but what we believe and know to be fact about Jesus Christ is recorded and written for us in this book. And going beyond, you know, even prior to Jesus Christ, obviously, in the Old Testament and you know, all throughout history, we have a record of, of human history found in God's Word. So look down here at the end of 2 Timothy chapter 3, where we started. The Bible says in that, From a child thou hast known the holy scriptures. And that's what these are. They're holy scriptures. They're the words of God. They're holy. They're perfect. They're true. He says, Thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. These scriptures, these words, are what is what makes people able to be wise, to get the knowledge, to understand how to be saved. And that's through the faith of, uh, which is in Christ Jesus. Verse number 16, the Bible says, All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. We rely on the whole Bible to give us our instructions. So one of the things that we believe here, it's not, we don't just base everything off of the New Testament. It's the entire Bible. The Bible says here that all scripture is given by inspiration. It's, been, it's, it's inspired by God. It's God breathed. God's words that came from God is what scripture is defined as in the Bible. This is what scripture is. It's the inspiration of God and it's profitable for us. It's profitable for doctrine. Doctrines are just our, our teachings. They're, they're, they're things that we believe about the scriptures. You know, there's all kinds of, you know, we're going through basic doctrines, doctrines on baptism, doctrines on salvation, doctrine, you know, it's what we believe. And the only way we could come up with those beliefs is through the scripture. That's why it says all scripture is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for showing people that they're wrong and, and, and how to be right, for correction. Hey, you're doing this wrong. Let me correct you on that. 
And how do we do that? How do we correct people? With God's word. Here's why you're wrong. Not because I don't like what you're doing. Not because I just think you should do something different and, and you're, you, know, you should do things my way. No, no, no. What you're doing wrong is because, well, God said this and, and, and you're in contradiction to that. So that's why you're wrong. And this is why you need to be correct is because God's word says this is what we're, this is our source. This is the, the standard. This is what we use to, um, to determine everything that we believe. It's and for instruction in righteousness, how to do right, how to do good. We have instructions here in this book. We rely on the whole Bible to give us our instructions and everything we believe about God, serving God comes from his word to us. And like I said before, it's Old Testament and New Testament. Flip forward to 1 Peter chapter 1. There's a few books. Forward to 1 Peter chapter number 1. If you're in 2 Timothy, you go forward through Titus and Hebrews and James, and you'll find yourself in 1 Peter chapter number 1. Verse number 15, the Bible says, But as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation, because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. Now, the reason why we turn to the Scripture is because this is, this is the New Testament. And what I'm going to combat here now is a little bit of people who don't want to go to the Old Testament for anything. Oh, that's the Old Testament. Jesus gave us a new covenant. We don't need to worry about that Old Testament. We go, we're free from the law. We're under grace. We don't, we don't really care about the Old Testament anymore. And they, just, they, they only want to deal with the New Testament. But that's folly and it's not true. We already saw that all Scripture is profitable. We've already seen that. But now we see in the New Testament this command to say, hey, be ye holy for I am holy. You know, just as God is holy, God wants us to be holy. He wants us to live a holy life. He wants us to live a clean, pure life separated unto him to be holy. 1 Corinthians 15, 34. You have to turn there. Turn if you would to 1 John chapter number 3. You're in 1 Peter. Just go forward to 1 John chapter 3. Just a few pages forward in your Bible. 1 John chapter 3. In 1 Corinthians 15, 34, the Bible says, Awake to righteousness and sin not. For some have not the knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame. So in the New Testament, we've seen, Be ye holy, for I am holy. We've seen, Awake to righteousness and sin not. God doesn't want us to sin. In the New Testament. So, in, I mean, you can't get much more New Testament here than 1 Peter, 1 Corinthians, right? And look at 1 John chapter 3. Uh, Three, we're going to see, well, what is sin? We're instructed not to sin. What is sin? We have the definition of sin in 1 John chapter 3, verse number 4. The Bible says, Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. When you commit a sin, you are transgressing, you are breaking God's laws. Where do we find God's laws? In the Old Testament. All throughout the Bible, the Mosaic law is referred to as the law. Those are God's laws. So if, if breaking one of those commandments, breaking those rules is called sin, and the New Testament says that we are to sin not, well, we need the Old Testament. Right? I mean, it only makes sense. How are we going to know if we're sinning or not unless we're studying God's word and the old law and making sure we know God's law so that we don't sin? It's extremely important. Don't let people downplay the importance of the Old Testament because, oh, well, we're in a new covenant now. Jesus got rid of all that stuff. No, he didn't. He said he didn't come to, uh, to destroy the law, but to fulfill. Now, I'm not going to get into the details. Obviously, there are a few things that have changed in the law that are clearly laid out. In, especially in the book of Hebrews, but in a few other places as well, where it's, it's been, um, you know, we, we no longer do animal sacrifices because Jesus fulfilled that aspect of the law. Jesus fulfilled a few other, you know, we don't keep the feasts either. There's certain things in practice that have changed in the New Testament when Jesus Christ came, but those are clearly laid out for us and have nothing to do ultimately with, with God, with the moral laws, with, with things that we would be doing, you know, stealing, murder, adultery, all that stuff, you know, that hasn't been done away. 
So we need, we need the whole Bible. The Bible says, uh, you know, we're not under the law, under grace. I've heard this argument, I don't know how many times. But that reference of not being under the law, but under grace is for our salvation yep, because we've been forgiven by the grace of God. That's, what it's, that's why he says that we're not under the law, but under grace. Why? Because we're forgiven. We're under grace because God forgave us of our sins through our faith in Jesus Christ. That's, that's, what, that's what that's talking about. But however, we're still called to sin not. I mean, Romans 6, Romans 5 says, well, you know, where, where sin did abound, grace did much more abound. You know, no matter how much sin there is, grace covers all of that sin. Yeah, amen. And we need it because we're still sinners even after we get saved. We need grace to abound, but shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. That's what Romans 6 says. So in order to not sin, we need to know the law. We need to study the Old Testament as well as the New Testament. Turn, if you would, to, uh, I'll keep you in the New Testament here. Turn, if you would, to Colossians chapter 3. I, I just want to spend a little bit of time making sure that we know, you know, I mean, all matters of faith and practice, that we, that we believe what we believe is based on the whole Bible. Not on one part of the Bible, not on our favorite parts, not just on the New Testament, but the whole Bible. The Bible says in Psalm 19.7, very famous passage, the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, is sure making wise the simple. So God's law is perfect. God's law is great. So there's nothing to be looked down on or, or avoided. We love God's law. If it wasn't for God's law, we wouldn't know that we're sinners. We wouldn't know that we need a savior. That's why the Bible says the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. Because the law is our schoolmaster, you know, show, leading us to Christ. Hey, you need help. Hey, you've, you've got a punishment that, that's coming to you and you need to save, you need someone to save you because you can't do it on your own. You've already broken God's law. Colossians chapter 3, verse 16. So it's not just God's law that we need out of the Old Testament. Colossians 3, 16, again, a New Testament reference says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. So right there, the New Testament is saying, we need the psalms. Yep. We ought to be singing the psalms. So you've got the law, you've got the psalms, and then you've got the prophets too. And I, I didn't go, you know, hopefully you can see in the points being made, we need the whole Old Testament. We can't just pick out parts. Oh, well, we don't need the major prophet. We don't need Isaiah and Jeremiah, Ezekiel. Well, what about their future prophetic visions of what's going to happen if you don't we want to read that? Don't you want to know about that? Don't, what, what about even just understanding, see, even just understanding the prophecies of the Old Testament about Jesus Christ coming, his first coming, is one of, the, one of the foundational principles, one of the main reasons and supports to believe the Bible to begin with. All the prophecies that have come true throughout Scripture. And you look at the way that, that God has given his word unto us, using many different men, using, you know, going all throughout time, you, you know, decades, years, hundreds of years, thousands of years apart from one another, and they all fit together so perfectly, without error, Amen. without any problems. This is, this, is, this is one of the reasons why, you know, we don't just have blind faith. It's very reasonable faith. It's still faith. You still can't prove this is God's writing, you know, and give you some mathematical formula to prove that God wrote these words down, but the proof is in the pudding. I mean, you look at the word of God, and we're going to get into that in just a little bit. I want to, I want to get too far ahead of myself. And then in, in Acts 20, 27, uh, you don't have to turn there. Turn, if you would, to Deuteronomy chapter 5. Deuteronomy chapter 5. So we see the law of the Lord's perfect. We need to know the law. We see that we're supposed to be singing, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. So we need the psalms. And then in Acts 20, 27, the Bible says, For I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. All of God's word. All of God's counsel is being taught and is being preached. And that's what we do here. And that's why you'll notice we'll go Old Testament, New Testament. We, we use the whole Bible to get all of our understanding. I mean, think about it. If you threw away the Old Testament, you'd be missing out on the Proverbs. I mean, just a whole book of wisdom. But see, normally when people want to throw out the Old Testament, they only want to throw out the law. They like Proverbs for the most part. They'll like Psalms for the most part. It's encouraging. 
But see, people who, are, who don't have integrity and don't want to just believe all of God's word will pick and choose and, and, well, we'll just leave this part out because I don't really like that very much. I don't like being told what to do. God's words, and we need to have this understanding and know why we love the Bible. Everything we believe on is based on the Bible. And when you understand that God's words are literally good for you, like this is going to help you every single day of your life if you can conform to God's words, you will have a joy. You, you will have the best life that we could possibly have on this planet by listening to what God has said by doing and hearing what God has told us to do. Micah chapter two, verse number seven, I'll just read this for you. The Bible says, O thou that art named the house of Jacob, is the spirit of the Lord straightened? Are these his doings? Do not my words do good to him that walketh uprightly? Aren't my, don't my words do good for him that, that does right? Deuteronomy chapter five, that's where I had you turn. Look at verse number 29. Deuteronomy chapter five. Verse 29, oh, that there were such an heart in them that they would fear me and keep all my commandments always, that it might be well with them and with their children forever. And I think that's too faceted on why God's saying, you know, oh, I, I wish they just had a heart to fear me and that they would just keep all of my commandments always that it might be well with them. Why, would it, why does he want to be well? Well, one, if they're not listening to his commandments, they're going to be punished. There's going to be judgment coming down. They ought to fear God for that. But not just that. Is that inherently in God's laws is that his laws are good for us. They are, I mean, without just re completely removing any aspect of punishment from God, when you break God's commandments, there is inherently built in consequences to all of sin, everything you do that's wrong, even without God even having to get involved, it's not good for you. So he's saying, I, I, man, if you just had the heart to listen to me, to believe me, and to follow my commandments, it might be well with you and with your children forever. He says, always going to be good for you if you just listen. Jump down to verse number 32. Verse number 32. You shall observe to do therefore as the Lord your God hath commanded you. You shall not turn aside to the right hand or to the left. You shall walk in all the ways which the Lord your God hath commanded you, that ye may live and that it may be well with you and that ye may prolong your days in the land which ye shall possess. He's repeating himself. You know, look, walk in the ways which the Lord commanded you and you're going to live. It's going to be well with you. You're going you're to lengthen your days. Things are going to go good. Turn, if you would, to Deuteronomy 6, the next chapter. Deuteronomy chapter number 6 in verse number 1. Chapter 6, verse number 1, the Bible reads, Now these are the commandments, the statutes, and the judgments which the Lord your God commanded to teach you, that you might do them in the land whither you go to possess it, that thou mightest fear the Lord thy God, to keep all his statutes and his commandments, which I command thee, thou and thy son and thy son's son, all the days of thy life, and that thy days may be prolonged. Hear therefore, O Israel, and observe to do it, that it may be well with thee, and that ye may increase mightily, as the Lord God of thy fathers hath promised thee in the land that floweth with milk and honey. I mean, it's so repetitive. Look, Liz, you know, God's pleading. Listen to my words that it might be good with you. Listen to my words that it might be well with you. Listen to my words that you can prolong your days. Listen to my words so that you can live a good life. Amen. Turn if you go to Deuteronomy chapter 12. Chapter 12. We need to treat God's word as our life because it directs every, it, it ought to direct every decision you make in your life, everything that you do and, and keep you from falling into snares and the traps and to heartaches and to problems and to misery and, and just listening. You know, if, if, we, if we can treat God's word and hold it up very highly and esteem God's word, it would, it, it would save so much grief. And it would be well with you. 
And this is God's promise. It will be well with you if you could just listen to my commandments and keep them. Deuteronomy chapter 12, we're going to look at verse 28. 12 verse 28. Verse number 28 of chapter 12, the Bible reads, Observe and hear all these words which I command thee, that it may go well with thee and with thy children after thee forever, when thou doest that which is good and right in the sight of the Lord thy God. I mean, how many times does God have to say it? Obviously, I know you're getting the point, but we see this over and over and over and over and over again. But let's keep reading here. Verse number 29. When the Lord thy God shall cut off the nations from before thee, whither thou goest to possess them, and thou succeedest them and dwellest in their land. Take heed to thyself that thou be not snared by following them. After that, they be destroyed from before thee. And that thou inquire not after their gods, saying, How did these nations serve their gods? Even so will I do likewise. Thou shalt not do so unto the Lord thy God. For every abomination to the Lord which he hateth have, have they done unto their gods. For even their sons and their daughters they have burnt in the fire to their gods. What things soever I command you, and this is important, verse 32, what things soever I command you, observe to do it. Do everything I'm telling you to do. Thou shalt not add thereto, nor diminish from it. Both of those points are important when it comes to God's Word. When we're determining what we believe, when we're studying God's Word, and we're, and we're making doctrine, for example, we do what God said, and we don't add to it. You know, when we look in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, and we see this list of things that, that we need to break fellowship over, and we need to you know, kick people out of church to, you know, from, we're going to use Scripture where everything is outlined and, and it tells us this is what you do. But we're not going to add to that. We're not just going to start saying, well, and, and just start adding our own rules. Well, if you go out to the movies, we're going we're, we're to break fellowship. You know, you're not welcome here anymore. If you dress this way, if you do, you know, whatever, commit this other sin that's not listed in the grievous sins in 1 Corinthians. You know, th this is, we're not going to start adding to God's word. And look, who would want to do that? God gave us plenty of commandments to follow. Let's just try to follow those. Let's not add to it. Right. Let's not make things harder, right? Let's just d do with what we got. Try, try to follow those. I mean, if you could follow those, you're doing great anyways. You don't need to add anything more to that. But also don't diminish from it. This is more popular, right? It's, it's, it's more rare for people to be adding to it, but it does happen. But don't take away from it either. Don't say, oh, yeah, well, we don't need this and this and this and this, and, you know, and just start going crazy just because there's been a few changes in the New Testament. You know, we don't observe the Sabbath. We don't do the animal sacrifice. And you just all fornication, that's not a big deal anymore, or, you know, whatever. You start going crazy with, with purging things and diminishing from God's Word. No, let's, let's stay right on track with God's Word. Don't add to it. Don't take away from it. And look, God's very serious about the integrity of his word. Turn, if you would, to Revelation 22. It's the last chapter in the book of Revelation in the Bible. Actually, the, the, the last chapter of the Bible. Go all the way to the end, Revelation chapter 22. Because in Deuteronomy, what's he doing? He's, he's giving the law. He's giving his commandments. And he's saying, don't add to it and don't take away from it. These are very, very, very important. And God is saying, what I said, this is the way it is. So don't mess with this stuff. In Revelation 22, we see the seriousness and the profoundness of someone tampering and adding to God's word, taking away from God's word, found in Scripture. Revelation 22, verse number 18. It's all the way at the end of the Bible here, one of the last verses of the Bible. The Bible says, For I, I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book. If any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. This is not some normal book. This is not your average book. You can't just go and abridge the Bible and just say, oh, I just want to read the Cliff's Notes. I just want to read the abridged version of God's word. God says, you don't touch my words. 
These are my words, not yours. You don't add to it. You don't take away from it. And there's serious, serious, serious consequences for the person who dares to change what God said. You do whatever you want to man's words. Break it up, add to it, make your own thing, but not with God's word. God's word has to be holy. And we don't pick and choose which parts of the Bible we like and don't like or which parts we're going to follow and ignore the rest. It's a package deal. It's the whole thing. As much as you need, and get this, as much as you need to believe on Jesus with all of your heart to be saved, you have to accept all the Bible as God's word. You have to believe on God's word. Jesus is our foundation. Turn if you would to 1 Corinthians chapter number 3. We're going to see here 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Jesus is the foundation of our faith. Right? Someone asks you, well, what are you relying on? I'm relying on Jesus. What do, you, what do you need to be saved? I'm believing on Jesus. Jesus is our foundation. He's our Savior. We had to believe on him for salvation. Everything needs to be on him. All of our faith is put on him. That he, he's our foundation. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse number 9 explains this. It says, For we are laborers together with God. Ye are God's husbandry. Ye are God's building. According to the grace of God, which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and another buildeth thereon. But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. So the Bible there very clearly is saying Jesus Christ is the foundation. Amen. He is the chief cornerstone. Now, we all had to hear about Jesus, right, in order to put our faith on him. Romans 10 explains that, explains the, the, the way that we hear about God. And um, in the end, it concludes in verse 17, so then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So in order for Jesus to be our foundation, we have to hear about him. In order to believe on him, we hear by God's word. So do you see how important the word of God is? It's, the, it's literally the source of our faith. We couldn't even believe on Jesus without scripture, without the Bible. We could not have faith without hearing by the word of God. John chapter 1. And you see, we have to put our faith in the Bible in order to put our faith in Jesus. Because you have to believe that what you're being told about Jesus is true. You're not going to know who Jesus is without hearing from the Bible. And if you're putting your faith on the Jesus of the Bible, then you are believing on the Bible. You are believing on God's word. And it's no coincidence that Jesus Christ is called the word of God. In John 1.1, 1, 1, the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. And the word was made flesh later on in that chapter and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glories of the only begotten of the Father. So Jesus Christ is the word. Jesus is the word made flesh. And God's word also is our foundation because Jesus is the word. And, and let me be, try to be as clear as possible about this. This object is just a book. It's, it's, it's some leather and some paper, right, and some ink. This is just an object. So I want to be really clear about this. I don't idolize this object. The, the paper and stuff like that. I mean, you, could, you can tell I don't idolize this object. I use this object, but this object contains Jesus Christ. Not physically. Jesus isn't bound by the binding in this, in this book. But the words that are contained in this object is the word of God. And Jesus Christ is the word of God. We revere these words as much as we revere Jesus Christ. The, uh, you cannot separate the two. Jesus Christ embodied God's word. Amen. And, and, just what, and I could go through so many examples of this from scripture. It's amazing. But turn, if you would, to John chapter 17. 
And we're going to compare John chapter 17 with John chapter 14. Very, both of these are very famous passages. I'm sure you've heard these before. But just one great example of Jesus Christ being the Word, and not just some name, the Word of God, but the meaning of Jesus being the Word of God. John chapter 17 and verse number 17. The Bible says, Sanctify, Jesus said, Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Jesus Christ saying God's word. You know, Jesus is praying out and saying, God, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. The word of God is truth. But Jesus Christ said in John 14, verse 6, Jesus saith unto them, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. So Jesus said, thy word is truth. And he says, I am the truth. Is inseparable from God's word. He is the word. He's the word made flesh. I mean, we could go on and on. Like I said, there's so, especially in the book of John, read through the book of John, you'll see so many examples of that. And, and the context of Jesus being the word and, and you know, all the attributes of God's word and the attributes of Jesus just completely match up. So turn, if you would, to, um, turn if you would to Genesis chapter 3. And, and, you know, I could do an entire sermon on Jesus Christ being the Word of God. But we need to understand that, is, you know, we're, we're focusing on the Word, which is Jesus. But um, this is what we go to to determine all matters of faith and practice within the church. Because thy Word is truth. Because God's Word has the truth. But, you know, let God be true, but every man a liar. We can't just rely on, many, you know, we're not like the Catholic Church that just relies on some God-man, some, some Pope to tell us, what we believe. We rely on God's word to tell us what we believe. Now, are there teachers? Sure, are there pastors? Yeah, of course. But what are we teaching? God's word. And what we're relying on? God's word. Not on tradition, not on, on just someone coming up with something and say, you know, coming up with rules out of their own heart. In, um, now, now, think about this because it's pretty evident, it's pretty obvious. I'm not going to prove this from scripture. Um, but I think everyone will probably agree that Satan doesn't want people to be saved. The devil, I mean, he's the adversary. He's against God. He's against us. He's against everything that's good. Now, try to put yourself in the devil's shoes for just a second. If you knew that people had to hear God's word to be saved, because Scripture says so, and I believe Satan knows that, that in order for us to be saved, we need to hear God's word in order to put our faith in Jesus Christ. Wouldn't you try to mess with God's word if you're the devil? If you're trying to screw up people and trying to get people to go to hell because you don't, you don't love people, you don't love God, and you're against everything that, that God does? It only makes sense. I mean, why wouldn't he do that? That would be like the first thing he would do is just mess with God's word because if you're breaking God's commandments, you're sinning, and if you're sinning, you're going to hell, Right? until you put your faith on Jesus Christ. So we need to hear from God's word in order to, in order to be saved. We need, we need to put our faith in God's word. We need to put our faith in Jesus Christ. God's word is our foundation, just as much as Jesus is. I've established that already from scripture. Psalm 11.1 1 says, In the Lord put I my trust. How say ye to my soul, flee as a bird to your mountain? For lo, the wicked bend their bow. They make ready their arrow upon the string that they may privily shoot at the upright in heart. If the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? God's word is our foundation. If this foundation is destroyed, if we don't have God's word to rest on, then what can we do? What can the righteous do? We've got nothing to go off of. Well, that is why Satan has always attacked God's word because he doesn't want you to have that foundation. He doesn't want you to believe and to know and to listen to God's word. He tries to mess it up. And that's what you had to turn to Genesis chapter 3. This goes all the way back to the beginning. His attack has always been the same. Look at verse number 1. The Bible says, Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. So the very first thing he does is he questions God's word, trying to cast doubt. Can you put your faith in God's word? Can you trust? Is that really what he said? 
and just throw all kinds of doubt in the, in the hearer of God's word. Did, did he really say that? But he doesn't stop with just questioning it. Verse number two, And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree, which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. Right there, changing God's word. Well, <laughs> you're not really going to die. See, because God knows that once you eat of that, then you're going to get all this knowledge and stuff. You're going to be like God. You're going to be, you know. No. Satan has attacked God's word going back to the beginning when there was only one commandment. Don't eat of this tree. What do you think he's doing when there's a lot more commandments than that? Of course he's attacking it. He's changing it. This is why we are King James Bible believers only. This is why we trust that in the English language, the, the King James Version of the Bible is the Word of God. Because Satan has been going around and changing God's words and screwing people up and mixing them up and making it so people don't have a foundation. And when you're changing God's word, as I mentioned before, just as much as Jesus Christ is the word of God, you're changing Jesus Christ. You're making up a new God. These new perversions of the Bible is perverting our Lord Jesus Christ because they're changing God's words. A couple of famous passages. Turn, if you would, to Psalm 29. Psalm 29. We believe that God's word is preserved for us today. The reason why we're King James only, we go through a few different reasons. One, we believe that God has promised already to, to keep his words. God is the one that, that, is, that is maintaining the integrity of his words. So even though Satan is coming along and changing things and corrupting God's word, God is making sure that he still has a witness, that his word is, is eternal, that his word will continue forever and ever and ever and can be found of those that seek him. His word is available. And his word is available today. A couple of places that, that tell us this from Scripture is Isaiah 59, verse 21. The Bible says, As for me, this is my covenant with them, saith the Lord. My spirit that is upon thee and my words which I put in thy mouth shall not depart out of thy mouth. So this is God saying, the words that I've put in your mouth, he says, they're not going to depart out of your mouth, nor out of the mouth of thy seed, which is a children, nor out of the mouth of thy seed, seed, saith the Lord, from henceforth and forever. So either God's a liar or this is true. That God's word is not going to stop. It's not going to cease. Your mouth, your children's mouth, your grandchildren's, forever. Just continuing on and on and on. God's word is going to be said forever. Amen. Isaiah 59, 21. Uh, Psalm 12, another very, stay, stay in Psalm 29, but Psalm 12, 6, very, very famous passage. The words of the Lord are pure words as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. God has made the promise multiple times that he is going to preserve the word, that, he is, that his word will be available from generation to generation to generation, and we believe that. Now, when you have multiple books all claiming to be the Bible, but they say different things. That's not God's word continuing forever and ever and ever. That's in, in the midst of that, you're going to find God's word, which it is, the King James Bible. But in all these other translations, they have been corrupted. Satan's attacked them. But thank God that he has promised to still preserve it for us. Because if God wasn't involved, Satan would get to all of them. Satan would change and corrupt all of God's word so we wouldn't have anything. But because God steps in and says, no, I am going to preserve my word, we have it available for us today. And he's made that promise. And his word has to remain and it has to stay through. Now, um, one of the ways that we can know the word of God is by its power. Psalm 29 gives a lot of attributes of the voice of God. And I think a lot of this is physical, like when you actually hear God's voice, but that's not just hearing, it's also his written word can be, can be thought of as the voice of God because we're hearing from God's word. So we're going to read through a little bit of Psalm 29. Look at verse number one of Psalm 29. 
Because we need to know, well, what's God's word and what's not God's word? What's the counterfeit? How do you know the difference? Psalm 29, verse 1. Give unto the Lord, O ye mighty, give unto the Lord glory and strength. Give unto the Lord the glory due unto his name. Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. The voice of the Lord is upon the waters. The God of glory thundereth. The Lord is upon many waters. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is full of majesty. The voice of the Lord breaketh the cedars. Yea, the Lord breaketh the cedars of Lebanon. He maketh them also to skip like a calf, Lebanon and Syrian like a young unicorn. The voice of the Lord divideth the flames of fire. The voice of the Lord shaketh the wilderness. The Lord shaketh the wilderness of Kadesh. The voice of the Lord maketh the hinds to calve and discovereth the forests. And in his temple doth everyone speak of his glory. The Lord sitteth upon the flood. Yea, the Lord sitteth king forever. The Lord will give strength unto his people. The Lord will bless his people with peace. We see these attributes of the voice of the Lord in many of these verses. So one of the things that, that I come away with when I read this is that it's powerful. Because we talk about the breaking of trees, the dividing of fire, and also, you know, God's word is powerful. And that is one of the, the, the dead giveaways when you're reading these various books that call themselves God's Word or the Holy Bible. There's only one that truly has power. That has the power to divide, even you know, dividing asunder of soul and spirit. Because that is the Word of God. God's Word is known by its power. When Jesus Christ spake, never man spake like this man. He spake with power, with authority, and not as the scribes. Jesus Christ is the embodiment of God's word. He spake with power. God's word has power. God's word changes lives. God's word can, can pierce through the heart. These other books, when, you just, you know, when I just read them, I don't know about you, but to me it's pretty obvious. I mean, anytime I hear some perversion of God's word, it's like, what is that? the voice of a man, not the voice of God. You just compare the versions on your own. And again, this isn't, this isn't a whole sermon on KJV only. I've done that many times before. and I'll do it again in the future. But just compare the versions. You should be able to spot the counterfeit. The KJV does not have any contradictions found within the pages of this book. And I've preached on that too. Bring, bring up what you think is a contradiction. And, I'll, and if, if that's shaking your faith, I'll try to help you out with that. But there are none. The modern versions do. And again, I've proven this before too. From, from the NIV, from the New King James Version, the contradictions that are blaring within the pages of that book itself. It's obviously a corruption when you study it, when you look at it, you say, hey, how can you have a book that's contradicting itself and call that God's word? And I mean direct contradiction, not, not like, well, you interpret it that way. No, I'm talking, you know, making Jesus Christ a sinner based on the words that they use to describe things that he's done by saying that being angry is a sin and then saying that Jesus Christ was angry. That's what the NIV does. They've perverted and changed and twisted. That's not God's word. It's not, it's not God's word. And that's why I believe when you're hearing the NIV, you're not hearing God's word. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Also, the modern versions are not even based on, you know, if it, just another point to consider, because I'm not going to spend, in, you know, very much time on this at all anymore. We're almost done with the, with the sermon, but when you're determining what is God's word in the English language for us today, you compare the modern versions to the King James Version, the King James Version are based on different Greek manuscripts in the New Testament. They're, they're different manuscripts in many, many cases. So it's not the foundation of the translation isn't the same. So you need to get that figured out. Well, wait a minute. What am I reading here? What is this sourced off of? What is this based off of? The King James Bible is based off of the Textus Receptus, which is just the received text. It's a text that churches have received basically going throughout history that this is the Bible. And it's, this, 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 um, it's also based on the, um, the common 
text. Not, not completely, but basically what's, what's really been widely used and accepted has been used in the translation of the King James Version, as opposed to the modern translations that find one or two scrolls hidden there, thrown in a wastebasket, and, oh, wow, they, we think these are really old, so we're going to forget about all of the rest of, you know, every, all the other evidence to the contrary and just use this one and corrupt God's word that way. So, um, again, that's, that's, that can go really deep and take a long time to kind of dig into that. I can encourage you, if you haven't looked at it before, look into it for yourself if, you're, if you have any doubts on what Bible is the word of God. But not just that, look at the fruit. Look at the fruit of what's being produced by the different Bible versions and the people who are using them and what's coming out of it. Look at Christianity as a whole. During the time that the KJV was, was practically the only version used, and, and look at how, like, you know, what, what, was, what was society like? What was English-speaking society like when the KJV was just being promoted? What, you know, you could look at uh, America as a, as a good example of that. But even in other countries, look at the, the, the freedoms and look at the, you know, the souls that were won and the boom in, you know, the, in Christianity in general during this time frame. And then you start looking at more recent years, when all these modern translations have been coming out, what's the fruit of that? The people are using that. Are they going out and winning souls to Christ? Are they going out and doing the work? Are they, you know, where is their fruit? It doesn't exist. John chapter 10 is the last place I'll have you turn. I just want you to see this last, uh, this last point. We need to respect God's word and... and um, Listen to God's word. The, God's word is, is pivotal. It's, it's, the, it's the foundation of what we believe. It is determining the things that we, that we know about God and the way that we worship God, the, 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 the way that we live our lives is found, given instruction in the word of God. John chapter 10 We start reading in verse number 3. Jesus said, To him the porter openeth, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calleth his own sheep by name, and leadeth them out. And when he putteth forth his own sheep, he goeth before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. And a stranger will they not follow, but will flee from him, for they know not the voice of strangers. This is Jesus referring to himself as the, as the good shepherd, and um, you know we're his sheep. And when Jesus calls, when you're saved, you're his sheep. And when Jesus calls, when Jesus speaks to you, we hear his voice. We know that this is God. And, there's something, and this is something that's, that's, that's hard to explain and more just kind of known. When you hear the King, and this is, again, another, kind of like another proof for just the King of Bible. When you hear this, the word of God, there's a big difference between the other translations because you should be able to hear the voice of the shepherd. And now, obviously, I think this is going a lot deeper than just the word of God, because this is also talking about like another shepherd, like a false prophet who we're not going to follow. I mean, if you're saved, you're going to hear the voice of the shepherd and not some, some stranger. So, like, and that's why when the Bible is talking about the end times and the Antichrist, even though he's going to do all these lying signs and wonders, the Bible says that if it were possible, he shall deceive the very elect. It's not possible. Why? Because we're saved. Because we hear the shepherd's voice. We're not going to hear the voice of a stranger. That's why. It, it, it's, it's spelled out right here. We're not going to follow the Antichrist thinking that that's Jesus Christ because we are Jesus' sheep and he is the shepherd and we know his voice and we're not going to follow another. It doesn't mean you can't get screwed up on doctrine or something like that, but, but when, it, when it boils down to it, we're not just going to go follow some other shepherd because you hear his voice. And... I think, and that's what I'm saying. The reason I'm saying is because I think that's the main interpretation of this, of this passage, but we could also look at his voice being his words. What is he saying to us? We're going to hear his voice. We're going to hear his words. And then jump down to verse number 24 there. Because he goes on and explains this a little bit further. John 10, verse 24. The Bible says, Then came the Jews round about him and said unto him, How long dost thou make us to doubt? If thou be the Christ, tell us plainly. Jesus answered them, I told you, 
and ye believe not. The works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me, but ye believe not, because ye are not of my sheep. As I said unto you, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. We need to follow the voice of the shepherd. We need to listen to everything he says because he loves us and he's looking out for us. At the end of the day, that's what, that's, that's what the shepherd is doing for his sheep. You know, I mentioned before, we want to look at God's laws because God's looking out for us, right? Because he's telling us, hey, don't do this. This is not going to be good for you, so don't do this. If you do this, you're going to be punished. But not just that, he's just trying to keep us from even more heartache and sorrow. The shepherd loves his sheep. He cares about his sheep. He wants his sheep to do well. He doesn't want, his, he doesn't want the wolf to come in and, and eat one of the sheep and destroy one of the sheep. He doesn't want a sheep to get astray and go wander off and get lost. No, the good shepherd wants to keep, our sheep, keep the sheep in. So when the sheep calls, we need to be listening. God's word is the voice of the shepherd, the Bible, the King James Bible that we use today. We need to be listening to God. We need to be reading this book regularly and everything that we believe is going to come from the Bible. Very simple concept, right? But I think some people end up getting confused about this, but we need to make sure that we are keeping this our authority and that we're not going, because it be, look, it gets easy after a while to start getting off into man-made logic and conjuring up doctrines and coming up with newfangled theories on things instead of just saying, I'm just going to believe what this book says. And people get so twisted around, especially with a lot of the dispensational stuff and just coming up with all this stuff. I mean, it's where people come up with like the gap theory because they don't want to, they want to try to reconcile the Bible with science as if it needs to be reconciled because they're trying to reconcile the Bible with, with science falsely so-called with lies that try to tell you that this world is billions of years old and that the, you know, and the Bible can't be true because of evolution and all this other nonsense. So they just come up with things. Oh, well, there's a gap here between verse 1 and 2 in Genesis chapter 1. No, there's not. That's not, what the script, that's not truth. Look, if it was true, it would be in the scripture. It's not there. They're trying to make a doctrine out of something that's not in the Bible. Don't do that. We make, we make doctrines out of what we find in the Bible, and that's clearly stated in the Bible. That's what we base our faith on. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for the clear instructions that you do give us, dear Lord, that you've preserved for us today, that you've kept around for us because you love us, because we're your sheep, dear God, and we're listening to your voice. I pray that you would please just guide us, instruct us, lead us, teach us, dear Lord and help us to have a humble heart and, and help us to, to really reverence your word and, and treat it as something that is so necessary, a necessary part of our lives, dear Lord, that we would read it daily, regularly, and, and look to your words for our instruction and not bristle away or, or um, reject your words just because you may not like what it says or because it points out some sin in our life, dear Lord. Help us to embrace your words and to know that you are only seeking our good. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.